UCLA, a disciplined, balanced team, work for good shots. Steve Patterson and Sidney Wicks drove for sure baskets. The 6'8 Wicks owned the backboards. At both ends of the court. Wicks again. Curtis Rowe exemplified the emphasis placed on defense by coach John Wooden. Sidney Wicks transformed it into two points. The Aggies were cold from the floor, shooting 37%. In contrast, UCLA was hitting an amazing 58%. The Bruins' scoring was shared almost equally among the five starters. Jimmy, now can you get off that guy going through? See, pressure him when the ball's quicker, and we got to get off that. Okay, go on home, Jim. Let's go. The Aggies' replacement, Jimmy Collins. Collins, number 22. And UCLA's Henry Bibby waged a shootout for the remainder of the half. State closed the gap to seven points in a half in which not one Aggie was credited with an assist. Early in the second half, with Sidney Wicks rebounding, John Vallely spearheading a furious fast break, and Henry Bibby's outside sniping, UCLA roared to a 19-point ball. Lacey was limited to eight points, far below his season average. Five-eight Charlie Chris, the smallest man in the tournament, hit 19 points. He was the Aggies' second leading scorer. Paced the Bruins with 23, followed closely by Wicks with 22. But the significant factor about the U-Clans was their balance, with all starters scoring in double figures. In Jimmy Collins, the Aggies had the best one-on-one -on -one shooter in the tournament. The 6-2 Collins topped all scorers with 28 points. He won a spot on the all-tournament team. Collins' individual excellence wasn't enough, and in the end, UCLA had won its 23rd consecutive tournament game. Happiness is victory, and a mother's pride. Coach Lou Henson summarizes the Aggie defeat. 
Last year we played UCLA, they had the big man, Lou Alcindor, and so this year we felt we had a better chance of beating them. But after Thursday evening's ball game, we found out they not only had one big man, they had five. They used balance, speed, and quickness to defeat us handily. <laughs> For three seasons, UCLA had ridden the tree-tall frame of Lou Alcindor to the national crown. Now, the situation was different. It was Jacksonville's seven-foot-two-inch giant, Artis Gilmore, number 53, who was controlling the tempo of the game, rebounding and scoring at a racehorse pace. Curtis Rowe fired the Bruins' only retort. Right now, man, look, smoothness on offense is the key. You got to keep coming, take it in to Art as often as you can now. Not a bad pass. Anytime you can take it in to Art, you got to make them try to foul or something, and you guys have got to go to the board. All right, hey, when Art gets that ball, baby, hey, when you feed the ball into Art, you come on around him and let Vaughn come down to the corner. So you got to get in the board. Like if he comes out to shoot the jump shot, you got to be in the middle to get the rebound. The U clans were committing frequent, uncharacteristic turnovers. Pembroke Burroughs, the Dolphins' other seven-footer, was connecting from the outside. Oh. Pembroke, you'll get him next time. He's gone. You'll get him next time. Mike, you don't get off your man. See, Artie's under there. He's going to block everything. Else. You got to go to the boards when Art gets the ball. Burroughs hit four early baskets. At this point, two things happened. First, UCLA, a strong outside shooting team, began to find the range. Second, the overzealous Dolphins were collecting numerous unnecessary personal fouls. We have to bring a chip around for Rex. <laughs> Wicks repeatedly blocked Gilmore's shots, and the Catfoot U clans, a precision team, were alert to every opportunity. Gilmore was being boxed out by the shorter Wicks. With Gilmore neutralized, the Dolphins' demise seemed inevitable. Jacksonville coach Joe Williams proved a prophet of doom. The thing he feared most, the UCLA fast break, was death to the Dolphins. Every turnover was turned into a Bruin basket. Arch 
gonna have to take it on in and make the guy foul. Jacksonville lost not only its poise, but also its scoring touch. The Dolphins failed to make a field goal in the final three minutes of the half. UCLA swept into the lead for the first time on Bibby's basket with 1.16 remaining. With the ubiquitous Sidney Wicks dominating the backboards, the Dolphins were being run into the floor. At the half, it was UCLA by five. like Wicks was still batting the ball back at Gilmore. And picking up points underneath. They're playing a zone. Now let me see what kind of zone they're playing. Gilmore and Burroughs, who combined for 22 points in the first half, were held to seven in the second. Steve Patterson was giving Wicks a strong hand on the boards while also contributing 17 points. Fouls continue to plague the Dolphins. Ultimately, this proved their undoing as UCLA outscored them 24 to 7 from the line. Wicks, with his constant harassment of Gilmore, forced Jacksonville into repeated errors. Once more, John Wooden's style of play was being executed in textbook fashion. to get the ball into Gilmore was killing the Dolphins. As was the outside shooting of the tournament's outstanding player, Sidney Wicks. Jacksonville's guards, Vaughn Wedeking and Rex Morgan kept the score respectable. Again, the U clan scoring was distributed among all starters. Curtis Rowe was the leader with 19. Gilmore suffered the ultimate indignity when he fouled out. It was a sad climax to a superb season, but he is young, tall, and talented. And you have not heard the end of Artis Gilmore. The scrappy Dolphins fought to the finish, but they were not a match for the more experienced, better balanced Bruins, whose winning strategy is outlined by Captain John Vallely. I think our game plan on defense was to try to front, front Gilmore and uh, have a man behind him to try to get the lob passes. Then the guard would sink over into the middle and try to block the pass to the high post. Because once they get to the high post, then they can dump it into Gilmore and just get good shots down there. Need we tell you that John Wooden was coach of the year, a fourth consecutive national title, and the Wizard was busy recruiting a tall redhead at Helix High in La Mesa, California, Bill Walton, a high school senior. The Bruins, well, they would recruit and reload for 1971 with Sidney Wicks and Curtis Rowan. How many people at that very time in the early 70s realized we were watching something the likes of which we will never have again? A college basketball dynasty at its absolute peak. Steamrolling all before it. There's too much talent out there for it to happen again. But in 1970, the Bruins were never better. We hope you've enjoyed our look back. I'm Bob Lee.